tonight, we're going to finish up the area of the incarnation with the person of the incarnate. So we'll be kind of recapping some of the things that we had talked about previously. And so I won't bother recapping what we talked about. Um, if you missed it, you can get the tape. <laughs> okay, under the person, uh, uh, the person of the incarnate, we could address it along these lines. One would be, who is that person? Well, it's the pre-incarnate person of Christ. Pre-incarnate, meaning that he existed prior to the incarnation, the incarnation being when he came in the flesh. Basically this, the second person of the triune God. And we discussed a little bit of the Trinity, and in the Doctrine of God class we go into a discussion on the Trinity. But that he is the eternal Son, God the Son, who in, in one form or another appeared as the angel of the Lord prior to his uh, birth in Bethlehem prior to his conception. And so, the person of the incarnate, the first thing would be that it would be the pre-incarnate Christ. Now, in discussing this person, we also know, too, that this person is deity. The deity of the incarnate Christ Now, again, we come to the discussion of combining the infinite with the finite. The, 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 a being who possessed the nature of man and the nature of God completely, never diminishing his deity, even during his humiliation or during his trial, his crucifixion, his death, Never was his human, was his, uh, excuse me, his deity diminished, and it's amazing that well maybe it isn't so amazing. It's pretty I guess really it's, it's pretty understandable that man since he can't understand he'll come up with all these different views, and you know that Jesus Christ was merely a good teacher, or that Jesus Christ was a prophet of God but not God himself, or. One, one view I read was, Jesus Christ was a model for men, and in the evolutionary chain of things, he was advanced further than most men of his age. And, and so let's try to explain away, well, how, who was this guy that came and who said these incredible things and did these miraculous um, things and ended up dying for it? And uh, we have numerous scriptures, and we went over the deity of Christ, and so I won't rehash any of that. But if you're not familiar with the doctrine of the deity of Christ, go back over your early notes. And you have everything, Colossians, you know, 1, 16, 17, deal with the deity. Oh, so many of them. So um, I encourage you to know those things. So the second thing we need to know about the person of the incarnate Christ is that this person is deity. He's existed from eternity past, and he's deity. But at the same time, there's a human aspect behind this person. So we need to look at, at the humanity. And a lot of what we're going to be discussing tonight will be dealing with the humanity of Christ. In his humanity was where, in his humanity where he possessed a complete human body, mind, and spirit. And in that humanity, Jesus Christ was able to grow and to learn. In that, Jesus Christ suffered death on the cross. Also, in his humanity was how he came to claim the title of the Messiah, and also the right to the throne of David, 
to carry on the kingdom of God on earth, to reign in the millennial reign. And it was through the incarnation that he could become the seed of David, one of the descendants of David. That, you know, he could not have possibly fulfilled that prophecy um, that in 2 Samuel that David's throne would be a, a, a continual throne, an everlasting one. So when we think of this, we, we understand that Jesus Christ possessed a body of flesh and blood, and he also could, could, excuse me, possessed a human soul or a consciousness and a human spirit. He's born of a virgin, and in his humanity he had sinless limitations. And those sinless limitations never detracted. He thirsted, he hungered, he wept, he died. And we'll discuss this even deeper, hopefully tonight, when we get to what we call the doctrine of um, what I wrote, the condescension and humiliation, or the doctrine of the kenosis is what the big word for it is. Um, the fourth thing that we need to look at when we look at the person of the incarnate is going to be the union of the divine and human spirit. of the human and divine natures. And it's not a dual personality. Jesus Christ did not possess a dual personality. He always, when he spoke of himself, he said, I, you know. And when people spoke of him, they said, thou, or you, or he. And so Jesus Christ, it wasn't a matter of, of that. He had two natures. He had one nature, one personality, one person, and the union of these two. Um, the idea is that the human nature continues forever, and um, you get the idea of this through like the post-resurrection appearances of Christ, that after Jesus Christ was crucified, he resurrected again in a physical body. He possessed a physical body. He ate fish, he, he, he had, and people could touch him, yet somehow, and people say, you know, he passed through walls. Well, we don't know that he passed through walls. And we just know he was there. And, uh, you know, how he gets from here to there. And, and, and on the Emmaus Road, he, he would be there, he'd talk to them, they saw him, yet after he was done with his discourse, he vanished from their sight. So, um, the, the idea of the resurrected body is, I, I find, very interesting. And to, a dangerous thing, as I discussed last time, is that to emphasize one nature over at the expense of the other is not, you can't do that without sacrificing um, the power to accomplish what Christ came to accomplish on the earth. If you emphasize the deity of Christ at the expense of his humanity, well, it was in his humanity that he suffered and died, right? It was in his humanity that he could come and reign as king, that he could, that he could do this, right? But if you emphasize his humanity at the expense of his deity, you don't have the pure sacrifice. You don't have the purity or the holy sacrifice. You don't have the power to overcome sin like Jesus did. And the ability not to sin. Not only the ability not to sin, but the impossibility to sin. Mike? Yes. Prior to his resurrection, did he exhibit any of the nature of his deity, or was he fully, did he live in the fully human sphere? Um, that's a good question. Jesus Christ, in, in his life, exhibited certain things, such as 
uh, of, of deity, certain attributes of deity or, or prerogatives of deity, such as the forgiving of sin, of sins against God. Uh, the miracles that he performed, and I'll discuss this a little bit later, some of the miracles that he performed, he performed by the power of God, or, you know, through the Spirit, but, uh, but some were by his own authority, to stand up and walk. You know, he just, by his authority, he would tell them to stand up, or he'd be healed, or he would tell the lepers that they were cleansed. And uh, so, yes, Jesus Christ, and then his claims, vocal claims to deity, such as, as we studied in, in, uh, in John chapter 5, that he, that judgment, he was going to judge the living and the dead, and that he had the power to give eternal life. In John 17, where he said, Father, glorify me with the glory which I had with you before the world was. You know, so yes, Jesus Christ did claim and exhibit his deity. Now, Let's go ahead and take a couple of, of uh, quick scripture references here and look at them as far as the union of the spirit of the, of the two natures. And we'll go ahead and start into this scripture, which we'll be back to a little bit later when we talk of the humiliation and, and the, of Christ. We'll just take two of them. If you want more, I have more, and I'll get, gladly give them to you. Let's look at the book of Philippians in chapter 2. This, in itself, I don't know if Paul meant it to be, but this scripture, because he's dealing with uh, Christians serving one another, and in context of that, he moves right into what seems to me to be the most um, complete definition of the incarnation of any single scripture. But he says in verse 5, he says, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. There it is, right there. Being in the form of God, being equal with God, nothing to be grasped or fought after, and, and was made in the likeness of man, took upon the form of a servant, made in the likeness of man, acted as a man, lived as a man. And then in John chapter 1, you have, you know, you can start with the verse 1 in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of man. The declaration of the deity of the Word, the eternal Word, and then you have back in verse 14, that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Two scriptures dealing with the incarnation, the high, what's called the hypostatic union, or the union of two natures, who was the eternal logos, the word, expre the expression of God, creator of all things, who was, verse 14, became flesh, who was made flesh and dwelt among us. And he was seen. And he interacted with people and he acted and lived a life as a normal human being would live it, controlled by the power, controlled by God in submission to the Father, submission to the Spirit. So the deity of Christ is unimpaired by its union with one person with that which is unfallen human nature, and the unfallen humanity retains its normal limitations. In other words, his deity never suffered when he took upon him the form of a man, because he took upon him the form of a perfect man, a pure man in the unfallen state, a sinless man, which is really neat. 
for you and me. If you think about this, that must mean that we're okay. You realize that? We're not. Because, because I'm a human being doesn't necessarily mean I'm evil. I mean, my human, the humanity, the pure humanity that, that God gave us is okay. It's okay. Jesus Christ never sinned, so it must be okay to be hungry and thirsty. It must be okay to cry. It must be okay to hurt. It's not sin. Now, in the relationship of the two natures, let's discuss that. And this will close the topic of the Incarnation. How did these two natures work together? What, what, what was their relationship? Now, we see that in Christ, in these two natures, that, once again, that neither of the two natures can lose any single aspect or any single attribute of that nature. In other words, the deity of Christ didn't lose any of his, in his deity, he never lost any of his omnipotence. All is all powerful. And it's, he never lost any of his omniscience. He never lost any his immutability or unchangingness. He didn't lose any of these things. And in his human nature, the human nature was still a complete yet perfect human nature. And these things didn't transfer over to one another. They didn't, he didn't like exalt the man or bring down, a, bring down God. They maintained their relative positions. They coexisted, in other words. Right, they coexisted in union okay. with one another not separately, and um, which means that the two natures had to work together. You know, um, Christ, I, I don't believe that Christ at some time, I think as far as I can see that Christ had a consciousness of who he was throughout his entire life. Even from the, if in his entire life it must be from the womb. That Jesus Christ knew who he was. Uh, you know, it's like the scripture it, towards the end of his life, you know, at the Last Supper, he knew who he was and from where he came. I think he always knew who he was. Yet, still he had to develop as a human being. And he had to grow. And so, what we have is, what we just read in Philippians chapter 2, is the self-emptying. Not the surrender of the divine attributes, not the giving up of the divine attributes, but... Um, limiting them or veiling them uh, to achieve his uh, purpose in the human in the human activities in the human sphere so that kind of summarizes the, the hypostatic union and uh, or excuse me the uh, incarnation and after all the other things we went through this um can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, I know I, I, I missed a little bit. See him. Uh, when Christ took on humanity, joint, however he did, however he did that, clothed himself with humanity. Could that, or does that mean that he, at that time, became a time limited? creature like we are yes that's what i thought and then when he was exalted and because so he lost some you know there's i you know I, i'm in the back of my mind i know he there are some things that he you know he did not grant he let those some things go he had to leave some things go to become one of us well i don't know exactly what you mean by let 
things go. He did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he never gave it up. He never surrendered his equality with God. Okay. In his deity, he was equal and still equal with God, working on par with the Father and the Spirit. Okay. Yet in his humanity, he only did those things that the Father showed him. In his humanity, he had to learn. But all of a sudden, he's limited to a body. In his humanity. Right. Right. And he was limited to time and space. He occupied. He became, yes. Yeah, he wasn't on the uh, He's still limited to that body. You know, I, he, right now, I guess my, is it. What's it like he's now? He's the first exalted, he's the first exalted, hum, you know, he's got a glorified human body, the first ever. Right. And he's yeah. at the right and hand of the body. He's still got that body. You know, he's not out full of, you know, he's not, say, his body, stay here, I'm going to go do this. He's there. Yet, he's omnipresent. Just by simple statements, for wherever two of them are gathered in my name, there I'll be in the midst of you. Well, there's yeah. How is several the groups of two or more, and then he also said he'll live in us personally. And he also said that he's going to be with each of us to the end of the age. So, in his deity, he's omnipresent. But that could that function couldn't that function also then be done? Couldn't he be doing that function through the Holy Spirit? Well, you get the idea in John. Um, I think it's 16, he indicates the Spirit would live in us, that the Father would live in us, and that He would live in us. Okay. That he, my Father and I will come and set up our abode in right. you. So, he, to me, there's a distinction there. Okay. Well, we'll find out. <laughs> so in our glorified body, we'll be omnipresent too? We're not God. I think in His deity, He's omnipresent. I think, I think still in His humanity, he's, he's in heaven, He's on the throne. And in His humanity, in his glorified humanity is what will come back and reign. But in his deity, he's still omnipresent. Because if he was once God and possessed the attributes of God, he can never, the immutability of God and changing, he wasn't going to change. It sounds separate, though. It does. It sounds as though his glorified body is going to be in a location. And his omnipresent nature, nature will be in every place. But it's not separate. It's still the same person. Yet that's that's the well. God, God the Son was confined to a specific location for 33 years. In his humanity, the way that like Schaefer and, and Walford and and Schaefer and Walford and, and um, I forget who else. I think even Tozer. Uh, the way they were describing it, and it was interesting, was they always making the emphasis, do not try to, you can, you can look at each nature, you can look at the divine nature, and you can look at the human nature, mm -hmm. but you cannot separate them. Yet, in his divine nature, he never ever quit being God. And as God, he must possess the attributes of God, and never you know, surrender them, yet he, in his humanity, he chose to forsake the use of those, though they were at his availability. He chose to forsake the use of those things and become limited to time and space and to live for 33 years and to suffer and to thirst and to die. Um, and naturally, then, my mind, automatically, there's, there's this division there. We have two, almost two people, yet that's over, you know, just the way that the scriptures continue to describe. Uh, you know, when you have God, you can't stop, God can't stop being God. So that means he's got to keep being God. At the same time, while he becomes a man, and it's still the same person. Does that make sense? I don't mean do we understand it. I don't think we're going to understand it. I would like to use the text here real quick. And let's look at... Um, I wasn't going to do this, but I think I will. 
see, page 120, your text. How many of you read your text? Did you like it? Yeah. It's a good text. It really is. I find it. It's. Let's look um, on page 120. He says uh, he has your title, Important Results of the Union of Two Natures. And it's interesting he broke it up into seven parts. He says seven important, at least seven important results. And the first result was that the union of the two natures in Christ is related vitally to his acts as pre-incarnate person. Um, that though his divine nature was immutable, his human nature could suffer and learn through experience. And, 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 and then we, that's how we, we have uh, you know, Hebrews 5.8 that says that Christ learned suffering. And that as a man, it says down there at the bottom, as a man, Christ could die, but only as God could his death have infinite value sufficient to provide redemption for the sins of the world. Thus, the human blood of Christ has eternal and infinite value because it was shed as part of the divine human person. So what he's saying is, is because of the incarnation, in the incarnation, because of the union of the two natures, that therefore the perfect Lamb of God could suffer the death and pay the price, which was of infinite cost. And therefore the death was of infinite value because it was the Son of God. Our God Himself in the flesh. The other one he says is the eternal priesthood, um, and in dealing with the internal the eternal priesthood, he couldn't act as a priest, as a human priest, in, 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 as as the priest as a priesthood would be, as as one who acts on behalf of another uh, with respect to God, as God Himself. So in his hum, human nature, he became, or he, in his incarnation, he became a man. And therefore, he could enter into the priesthood. And he could be, as uh, the scriptures say, a priesthood uh, in Hebrews, uh, after the order of Melchizedek, an everlasting priesthood. And the other one, the third one, would be um, as a prophet. And he makes an interesting statement, I think. God, to reveal himself at the very end of the paragraph, God to reveal himself through man, uh, Excuse me, it was the very purpose of God to reveal himself through man, and this required an incarnation. Hence, the eternal Logos, the Word of God, declared the nature of God by becoming man. Who better could declare God but God himself? And then in becoming man, he portrayed who God was. Who is, you want to know who God is? Just read about Jesus Christ, and you'll see. You'll see God portrayed uh, clearly. And, and it's everything from his, his compassion and his goodness and his love and his judgment his, his wrath you'll see God portrayed out uh, the kingly office as I discussed earlier in order to fulfill the, 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 the Davidic covenant or become a seat of David to sit on the throne he had to become incarnate through the lineage of David also through the incarnation you have the worship of Christ as God. And um, we see that several places throughout the, uh, throughout the scripture where Jesus Christ was worshipped for healing people. Uh, Thomas, you know, my Lord, my God. Uh, other places where, he, where he, in the book of Revelation you see the worship of Christ around the throne. And uh, also the worship will also extend into the millennial kingdom. And then it says in number six would be the ascension of the incarnate to heaven. Uh, in other words, to be the firstborn of all creation, to, to, to initiate the resurrection that we too can enter into. Um, he had to die in order to die, to, in order to resurrect. So in order to die and resurrect, he had to be incarnate. And then seven... An important result was the union of the two natures in Christ. Free from sin is human nature, no sin nature, neither nature affecting the other adversely, but both working in union. So each of those points you could expand on quite a bit. And uh, that's so much of the study. I think now what we'll go into will be point three, and we'll discuss the life of Christ. Does anybody have any questions on the incarnation? The Christ, the Son of God, the eternal Son, becoming a man. Okay, hopefully.
hopefully I'll raise new questions as we go on. <laughs> now I think, uh, as we move into this part, the gospel accounts, people spend years and years studying the gospel accounts of the life of Christ. So there's no way that I can even begin to do justice to this topic because I'm, I'm only going to cover it quickly in order to just point out or show the humanity of Christ. Now, in the Gospels you find it's kind of like uh, um, each, each Gospel writer writes in, in a different view. Um, you see Matthew writing as portraying Christ as King of the Jews, as the Messiah. You see Mark writing of him as a suffering servant, and some uh, commentator said that it was like the gospel of action. You read, you know, what's the word? Immediately. Immediately, you know. And when you read about the baptism of Christ, and he rose from the water, immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. You know, other ones say he was led by the Spirit. Mark, he was driven by the Spirit. The gospel of action. The servant, the suffering servant of Jehovah. And Luke, Luke portrays a beautiful story of a, of a human Son of God, the humanity of Christ. Not just the human Son of God, but he portrays the humanity of Christ, the, 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 the healer, the, the one who interacted with people, his, his lineage being given the lineage of Mary, and given the accounts of the angels speaking to the shepherds, and... and uh, and these sort of things. So Luke could, you know, find that. And in the Gospel of John, deity. Jesus Christ is a God. We could cover several areas. Um, and I'll cover the areas that your book talks about. And, and like I said, it'll be kind of quick. If you have any questions, uh, don't be afraid to ask. First of all, under the Gospel accounts, you have the birth of Christ, or and, and or the conception. I'll tie all that together. And in this, you have pointed in the life of Christ. You have that he was born of a virgin. That of, that the uh, the scripture in Isaiah, a virgin shall conceive a child. And Mary, who is told of the angel, well, how will this thing be? You know, gonna, and I know because I don't know a man. I've never been with a man. The thing which shall be conceived in you will be conceived of the Holy Spirit. This holy thing shall be conceived with power, from power on high. So you have at his birth the, the declaration of um, one that he was born of a virgin, the other that of his, of his eternal nature, of that it referring back to Isaiah and also that it was uh, a holy child. In the... Uh, you also have things like the human genealogies that trace Jesus Christ from the time of uh, Luke traces his genealogy back to Adam and uh, Matthew traces it back to Abraham. And so you have, and, and, and Matthew tracing the genealogy of Joseph. So in each one, Joseph, uh, Matthew portraying the, the legal line of, of the seed of David and how Jesus Christ had the legal right to the throne. And then uh, Matthew or Luke tracing the genealogy that would show the physical birth of Jesus Christ as the seed of David. Now, in the Gospels we have what I guess some people call 30 years of obscurity. 30 years or so where we just don't know too awful much about what happened to Christ. We know that Jesus Christ, it says, look, you know, that he, he grew. You know, he grew in, in wisdom and favor in the sight of God and man. So physically, he grew. He grew from an infant to a man. Uh, he was a carpenter, we find, in different accounts. Isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't it Jesus, the son of Joseph, the carpenter? The Nazarene? So we have that 
you know, he was known. It wasn't like he grew up in some obscure little little cave somewhere. And at the time of his, you know, coming forth, he immediately came out of his cave and went down and got baptized. He grew up. He interacted with people. They knew him. The people of Nazareth knew who he was. Uh, that's one reason why they you know, they rejected him. They, we know who the, he is. We know his brothers and sisters. So, but we also see, I think, in that 30 years, um, that he recognized a, a self-consciousness of his, of, of his, who he was, that he was the Messiah. And the example being that, that at the temple, uh, approximately, they say, you know, 12 years old, he's in the temple, and he's discussing, he's questioning and answering questions to, with, with the religious teachers. And they're amazed at his doctrine. They're amazed at what he says. Now, and when his mother goes back, you know, well, you know, where have you been? How can you do this thing to us? And she says, and he says, the popular verse, you know, don't you know? And it should not be about my father's business, my father. She says, don't you know that your father and I are looking for you? He says, I'm about my father's business. So he recognized who he was and, and where he was from, even in his early years. Now, I think also it's important to note, I grew up in a church that really liked to talk a lot about the little child Jesus and talk about things that he did as a kid. And, you know, and there's even some really strange stories or uh, books or something that talk about, you know, well, Jesus Christ made doves, you know, out of, I don't know, nothing, and he killed some kid or something for doing something wrong. You know, you hear all sorts of weird stuff, and obviously I don't pay too much attention to them. I think if God was really worried or really concerned that we know what went on in Christ's early years, that he would have told us. Um, it seems to me that he obviously doesn't intend for us to know the details um, of this portion of Christ's life. But he did tell us enough in this that we can know enough that it testifies of his person, that he did exist. must have been interesting for that 12-year-old boy, you know, knowing the things of God to be able to try to communicate, you know, through those human limitations. You know, you, you know these things in your mind. It's sometimes like he must have been, I, I can't have been, he must have been lost for words at some point, you know, trying yeah. to get across what he knew, you know, in his essence. I've wondered that. Um, Even as a little baby, Laying yeah. there crying, you know, Can't yet with a consciousness that he knew he was the Messiah, yet a human nature that had to grow and had to learn, had to learn to talk and had to learn to walk. It's interesting. Would he have had that consciousness even when he was a baby like that? I believe so. I, I don't see any reason why not. And I can see every reason for him having it. He knew who he was. Uh, for sure, he stated he knew who he was and where he came from at the Last Supper. Prior to that, it was pretty obvious, at least by his ministry, that he knew who he was. Because he always says, my father. You know, I do what my father wants me to do. He did perform the miracles and acts and works of God. It indicates to me in, in the Gospel of Luke at this incident at the temple, when he was 12, that he knew who he was. And he knew where he came from. And who else was going to tell him? You know, yeah. if he wasn't self-conscious, then how's he going to know? Somebody going to come up and say, oh, by the way, did you know you're the Son of God? Right, right. You know, or some it's great revelation. Now, there's doctrines that say that you know, Jesus Christ really, you know, after his baptism, then he became, you know, the Messiah. And at his crucifixion, he wasn't the Messiah. And he went to hell. And, and then he rose again from the dead. And then he was, you know, God the Son again. Uh, as a matter of fact, some prominent Christian uh, teachers teach that very thing. Now, Jesus Christ had a great public ministry, and uh, there's no way I can ever really cover this either, but in his public ministry, Jesus Christ did a lot of things. You know, and this is where people go, oh yes, Jesus Christ was a great teacher. Jesus Christ is a prophet of God. And you know, 
he did. He, he, he began, you know, his ministry, the message of repentance. He taught forgiveness and loving your enemies. He taught, you know, the, the, sermon, the sermon on the Mount, the, the Beatitudes, and, and uh, just some of the most sound doctrine, the most sound doctrine ever taught. And, but in the course of his ministry, Jesus Christ was portraying who the Father was, who he was, and the work that he was to accomplish. And that's, you know, it, it, Jesus Christ was born to die. He was born with the purpose of being sacrificed. So when, you know, all this time, all his life, he had one goal, and nothing was going to stop him from that goal. You know, when you read the Gospel accounts and, the, and his movement on up into Jerusalem, that determination... He had to go to Jerusalem because he had to complete the purpose for which he was sent. So, you know, and throughout all his ministries, you see Jesus Christ revealing the Father, revealing the love for common man, everything from Nicodemus, the religious Pharisee, the, the, uh, a, a, leader, a good man, a, a ruler of the Jews, uh, who he spent time with and ministered to, to the woman of Samaria, despised his... You know, the Samaritans, despised of the Jews, and only that she was a woman who were really lowly in the eyes of the people, of the men of that time. All the way up to the, the Passion Week when you have, and during that Passion Week, and we'll discuss this, is where Jesus Christ revealed basically the idea of the church through John 13 through 17. Jesus Christ uh, revealed the church and what was going to be the next, if I may use the word dispensation. Now, then his, then his death, his crucifixion, his rest, his trial, physical death on the cross, his resurrection and ascension. And we'll discuss these in more detail. The, the crucifixion, the resurrection, and ascension, hopefully next class will we'll be far enough along where we'll, we'll start addressing the, um, the crucifixion of Christ. So the public ministry of Christ was uh, not, just to, not just only to show men a good way to live, not just only to be a prophet of God, but to prepare a man to move him along, to get him to the point to where he can reveal himself as the Messiah and pay that debt on the cross and die, that he might resurrect and descend and be seated at the right hand of God, to where he could be that infinitely invaluable sacrifice to pay that infinite debt that we owed, that he could resurrect and be the, you know, be the first fruits from the dead and give us hope. Give us hope. You know, um, when you get your eyes on Christ and you have your eyes on the hope of the resurrection, the grave's not so scary. The grave's not so awesome. At least for us, I think it, for me, it sends a real kind of like a, a sick feeling into my stomach for those that I know that are, don't know Christ because they're going to die and they're going to go to hell. That's fact. That is fact. Either that or Jesus Christ is a liar. And through all the revelation of Christ, we need to accurately, as accurately as possible, portray Jesus Christ in our words and our deeds and our teaching. Because you know you know somebody who doesn't know Christ. And when you think about that, remember that when they reject Christ, their judgment is awesome. So, public ministry of Christ led up to the crucifixion and resurrection. Why don't we take a break and come back in a few minutes. Then, and it was three major areas that, that he spoke of. And one was, was in the Jewish sphere of life. The other was the, the kingdom. And the third would be the church. 
Now this is the way Walvoord in your text broke it up. I encourage you to go over and look at it. Um, but when we look at, you know, this, this topic here, we find like that Jesus Christ lived under the law. And Jesus, in fact, Jesus Christ said he didn't come to abolish the law, but to establish the law. And he fulfilled the law. He never, he, he was the perfect man. The only one ever to fulfill the law. The law being God's divine standard. Here's what's acceptable. Nobody can do it. Therefore, we all fell short. All of mankind fell short. So, Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. And he kept it perfectly. Um, he insisted on the practical application of spiritual issues that had uh, been polluted by the religious leaders. And he let them know it. That's... Uh, because, you see, he knew the law, he knew it perfectly, and he fulfilled it perfectly, and he knew that nobody could keep the law. So when he saw the Pharisees and the Jews, and the, the wicked Pharisees, there was, you know, guys like Nicodemus that seemed to be pretty cool. He let them know it, because they were hypocrites. And um, let's take a look at, uh, let's go to um, Matthew chapter 23. Leaning towards the uh, end of his ministry, and uh, he's really stirring up the, the Pharisees. You see in Matthew uh, 23, you start in verse 1, he says, Then spoke Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All, therefore, whatever they bid you, observe, and observe, that observe and do. But do not after their works, for they say and do not. For they have, for they find heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and, and enlarge the border of their garments and go on and love the uppermost seats of the feast. That basically. You know, what they say oh, many times is right. That, you know, the whole, but don't do what they do because they're hypocrites. They don't do what they say and they like to be seen of men for their own glory. And then you can, let's see, then if you look over at verse 13, he begins kind of pronouncing some pretty heavy uh, statements against them. He says, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut the kingdom of heaven against men. You shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, neither permit them that are entering to go in. And he just begins pronouncing these woes against the hypocrisy of the religious leaders. And this is what made Jesus mad. You'll find in, in, the, in the ministry of Christ, go back over and look at who he gets mad at. He doesn't get mad at the prostitutes or the tax collectors. He gets mad at religious hypocrites. He gets mad when they're polluting the house of his father. Or when they, they bind people with, with, phone, with, with loads that not even they are even willing to try to carry of, of being right, of dressing right, of washings and cleansings and, and all these, you know, and we've all heard the ways, you know, right way to open an egg and all these things that are just totally absurd. They have nothing to do with the kingdom of God, yet they get men so preoccupied in religion, they forget God. It's like getting steered away. Like every other world religion outside of Christianity, it'll steer men away from God because it gets them wrapped up in the do's. Do this, do that. So, anyways, Jesus Christ, in the idea of the sphere of the Jews, he came and lived the law perfectly. And that's another thing that just irritated the daylights out of the Pharisees. In John chapter 8, he says, Which one of you will convict me of sin? Well, he set himself up. Okay, you know me. You've been following me and watching me like, like a hawk for the last three years, or however many years. Which one of you will convict me of sin? I'll tell you what, if I said that, I, could, I bet you'd be like, oh, I know what. <laughs> what about the time when you... <laughs> well, we'll forget about that one. So, he fulfilled the law, kept the law, 
and insisted on practical application. In fact, the time when the scribe came to Jesus Christ in the Gospel of um, let's see, was it Mark? Mark 12. Um, yeah, Mark 12, 28. Asking, what is the greatest commandment? It says in uh, verse 28, And one of the scribes came, having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well. In other words, Jesus Christ had caught his attention. He was, ser he was serious. Which one... He asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus said, the first commandment of all is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. The second is this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Practical application of the law. They had 400 odd different laws of sacrifices and and rituals and, thin, and washings and all the things they had to do. And Jesus Christ summed it up right here. Love God and love your neighbor. And if you do these two things, you've completed the purpose of the law. Because the law was not to make man righteous. The law was a statement against man. It was like the gavel hitting the... the or the hammer hitting the gavel is like, bam, guilty. You're guilty. You can't do it. You're out. Jesus Christ fulfilled that for us. So, in the sphere of the Jews, he insisted and he, he, he directed man to the highest form of the law, and that being love God and love your neighbor, and he fulfilled the law for us. Now, in the idea of the kingdom, in the sphere of the kingdom, you read about the kingdom of God. You know, um, some people say, well, there's the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, and there's the kingdom of David, and there's the kingdom, you know. Well, and there's different kingdoms. And I don't know if there's a difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of, of, uh, of God. But, and I guess that's a whole teaching in itself. But one thing that you can be sure of, the Bible, from Old Testament prophecies, like Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, deal with the incarnation of Christ, deal with that he would come and what? Reign as a king. It's a, it's a major point in the incarnation of Christ. In his life on this earth, it is, it's no small point in scripture that Jesus Christ will fulfill the Davidic line and will reign as king in the millennial kingdom. And Christ addresses this um, once again, you see it in Matthew, you know, establishing his legal line, and, and uh, Luke establishing his physical line, to the right to sit on the throne of David. And um, so the idea of the sphere of the kingdom, you know, are you a king, Pilate said. Jesus Christ, you said it, for this purpose I came. Um, let's look at that. I think that's the Gospel of John. Yes. Gospel of John, chapter 18. He says, uh, verse 33, Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it, tell it, tell thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priest have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from here. So he says he did have a kingdom. He did possess a kingdom. And obviously it wasn't now. It wasn't in this world at the time. And Pilate therefore answered, therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? And Jesus said, Thou sayest that I am a king, and to this end I was born. And for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate asked him a great question. What is truth? So, he said, that was to this end I was born. So that the fact that Jesus Christ was born, incarnated, 
as this eternal Son of God incarnate to this life, was one of the main functions was to establish his throne, on the, or his position on the throne of David. Very light teaching over a very heavy topic. <laughs> now, the other sphere that I'd like to address is the sphere of the church. And you can look at the Gospel of John and go from verse from chapter 13 to chapter 17. And in this, and, and just make references to these, you will find first Jesus Christ, he, 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 he comforts, he works at comforting his, his followers. In verse 14, he says, Let not your heart be troubled, but believe in God, believe also in me. And he goes on and he, and, he, and he starts talking about sending the Comforter. He deals with his death. And he talks about sending the Comforter and that he would come and live and abide with them. But in the idea of the church, what he's dealing with here is the new way that God was going to deal with the world. Never before had the Holy Spirit been sent to the world to abide in the believers. The Holy Spirit in the past, in the Old Testament, would come upon an individual to empower them for service for God for like a, a time, a short, a, a period of time. Yet with the believer, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in us and sets up a permanent residence in us. And Jesus Christ said that He would come and He would set up a resident in us and He would live in us. And in His priestly prayer in John 17, He, he establishes a purpose for the church one is that that we be a witness to the world. And how do we establish that witness? Um, verse 21 and 17 says, That they may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So through the unity of the church being the prime example of, of, the, of God, of the love of God, that God sent Jesus Christ. It's hard to believe that God really loves the world and that Jesus Christ loves the world too and that he died for the world when the church is so busy biting each other's head off uh, that it can't spend time loving one another. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about that and uh, I think it's, it's almost a shame we do so much talking and not enough acting. And I speak for myself at the same time. We need to make time for each other. Um, God's been showing me a lot of really neat things lately. But one of them is that can we make time for each other? You know, we're so busy. I don't have time to love somebody else, even the unlovable. Okay. The spheres of the earthly life of Christ. Now, there's also the offices of Christ, and these also I will address very briefly because I really want to get into this next topic. Prophet, priest, and king. And because I'm addressing these uh, clearly, do not think that they are not important. Each of them is uh, very important. Prophet, priest, and king. One, as a prophet, Jesus Christ came to reveal a prophet. The ministry of the pro a prophet was to reveal God or to reveal God's will. Correct? Basically. Basic definition. Jesus Christ came to do just that. He expressed the Father's will. He showed us who God was. And uh, basically, He became the, de the declaration of God in human flesh. As a priest, a priest is a man is, is a man duly appointed to act for other men in things pertaining to God. Hebrews describes Jesus Christ as our high priest. One who is appointed by God to act in our behalf to God, ever making intercession for us. And boy, do we need it. And the third one, King. As we just discussed, one of the fundamental purposes of the Incarnation was the fulfillment of the Davidic Covenant, which Jesus Christ will fulfill the covenant, and He'll sit on the throne. But He had to become incarnate. He had to become of the seed of David. That's cool. fulfillment of one. Davidic kingdom. Covenant. Covenant. Okay. Point B. The 
condescension and humiliation of Christ. Involved, what is involved in this in the condescension and humiliation? That's big words. To 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 condescend is like to come down to humiliation, humbleness, or to be humiliated. In this is involved Christ becoming a man, Christ suffering, and Christ dying. The taking on to himself the human limitations while retaining his eternal deity, which we discussed as the incarnation, not diminishing his deity, but adding a human nature to the divine nature. Taking up into the divine nature a human nature. God becoming a man, not man becoming a God. So, the condescension is this, that the eternal Son of God condescended or came down to be a man. And the humiliation is that as a man, he submitted himself to the death on the cross and all the things associated with that. <laughs> and then there's the exaltation where Jesus Christ rose from the dead. So you have condescension where the eternal Son of God came down, condescended to men, the humiliation where he submitted himself to the death on the cross and the exaltation where Christ rose from the dead ascended into heaven and where he was exalted to the right hand of God let's turn to our Bibles turn in our Bibles to the book of Philippians chapter 2 we read this verse earlier. This, what we'll be discussing, is known as the doctrine of the kenosis. I'll write that word down. The doctrine of the kenosis. Which part? Um all of it. The whole thing. Well, I'm wrong. Excuse me. Really, basically, it doesn't deal with the exaltation. I'm sorry. The kenosis deals with the condescension and the humiliation. Now, and it deal, It means emptying of. The emptying of. It deals with the self-emptying of Christ. And, uh, Let's go ahead and read this verse again. And then begin to discuss some, some, some things here, some points. So we're dealing with Christ. Verse 5 says, who being in the, who, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion of man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. There is the humiliation. The condes condescension, who being in the form of God, verse 6, thought it not, be evil, not, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, verse 7, but made himself of no reputation. The condescension. The humiliation, verse 8, that when he was as found as the fashion, in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, the death of the cross. The exaltation, wherefore God hath highly exalted him, given a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and things in heaven, and things in the earth, and things under the earth, and at, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The word being or the statement in verse 6, being in the form of God. 
Some translations have the word existing in the form of God. And that word implies a continued existence. It's not, it's like, it's, it's like it implies the pre-existence of deity prior to his birth and, um, and a continued deity afterwards. The words thought it not robbery sometimes are translated a thing, thought it not a thing to be grasped, or thought it not a, a, to be counted, counted it not as a prize to be grasped or held on to, something to be clutched. A um, rewording or a, a, a translation of that that I, I got out of uh, our textbook, he said, who though he was and at present continues to subsist in the essential form of God. In other words, who was and who is and continues to be in the essential form of God, yet did not regard his being on equality of God and majesty with God, a prize or treasure to be held fast. It wasn't something that he thought he had to fight for, he had to hold on to. It wasn't something he earned. It was what he was by nature but emptied himself of these things. Okay? Are you following me? I'm trying to build this point kind of slow. Some of it's familiar, I hope. <laughs> now, he's letting something go. Right. Regarded as something not to be held, but as rather as something to be let go. Well, yeah, and it says, you know, okay. it's like, but made himself of no reputation in uh, this translation. You know, he did not, he didn't grasp that the equality of being with God, or equality with God as if it, you know, had to be retained by effort. It wasn't something that he had to try to be. It was something that he was. Now, in this, we're not saying that Jesus Christ ceased to be God. We're not saying that he stopped being God, but that he added the form of a servant. Do you see the difference? When he, when he made himself of no reputation, it doesn't mean that he quit being God. It doesn't mean that he forsook that part of his nature, but he added to himself the form of a servant. And the word form is a word that speaks of an outward appearance, a manifestation. So the outward appearance, he took upon him the outward appearance of a servant. What's it? Go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm struggling with this. What? So then, so then what did he empty himself? If somebody empties something out, it's gone. Isn't it? He okay. put aside, he lay aside these things. Okay. To become a man. To become a man. Correct. Okay. But he didn't forsake them. What is that? So, so what, what, see, what is you, that? you have here, okay, but he made himself, okay, he's equal with God, you know, it wasn't something to be grasped or to, to, to hold on to. to. By effort. It was just something that he was. So, mm -hmm. He was equal with God, and he, you know, didn't have to have put out any effort to be equal with God because he was God. Okay. Now it says, "But he made himself, but made himself of no reputation. He chose to make himself of no reputation. Took upon him the outward manifestation or the form of a servant. From eternity past, God always was God. You know, the, and, and his manifestations were." Flames of fire, you know, pillars of fire, burning bushes, angel of the Lord, uh, usually something along those lines. And now he became a servant. And he took upon him the very nature of a servant and was made in the likeness of men, in the likeness that he acted like a man. He took on the likeness, the characteristics of a human being. Jesus had to eat. Jesus had to breathe. He had to, he had to be a human being. He had to grow up. 
So he took upon him the likeness of a human being. He took this into him. So in his manifestations, in his, the word here is um, form, in his appearance, he now was appearing to man as a servant. Okay? Okay, instead of, instead of a bright, flaming, glowing something or other, you know, that you know, he could have, instead of appearing like a normal man, you're saying, you know, he could have been something nobody could see and walk around and said, isn't it obvious I'm God? Is that what we're, because he could have done that. Well, he could have, he could have he always did. just stayed aloof from man. He could have just, you know, but here he, he came down to, he, he condescended, he came down to the level of you and me to meet us at where we're at. So I'm just going to say in my Schofield notes when he actually emptied himself was of his physical glory. He yeah. divested himself of his physical glory. So he was empty. The only thing he was emptied of was his visible glory. Right. So that's what you're saying. Yeah. Right. That's okay. okay. The, well, you know, um, it wasn't. He, he was. He also. It wasn't just an appearance of a bouncer. I mean, it was. Wasn't it? I mean. And he actually, yeah, he well, actually became. He took upon him the form of the outward appearance and manifestation of a servant, uh -huh. and was made in the likeness of man. So he took upon him the complete human nature, the outward physical appearance, as well as the whole nature of man, the likeness of man, the, the mind and the spirit of man. He was a, a human being. And that's that's what this is saying. It's like I said earlier. I don't. I don't know if Paul intended this to be such the, the, such a complete uh, exposition on the incarnation and the, and the kenosis or the humiliation of Jesus Christ, but because in context he's dealing with us. But it's the, it's to me it's it's yeah the basis. I want to read something real deep into that kenosis, that emptying, as there, something more than just glory. Uh, when you know, um, and maybe that's. If you're right, the context is something that, uh, that's important to, to keep in mind. Let's, let's keep moving and maybe we'll open up some more questions and answer a few of them we've opened up. See, he says, he, in verse 8, keeps going, he says, And being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. So, you know, you kind of get the idea, the form of a servant, the likeness of a man, and the fashion of a man. You know, and you think of something, uh, the idea is something more transient of a, a manifestation of humanity, such as uh, weariness. You know, he, the, as, as, as we get weary, as we have thirst and, and human limitations, so did Christ. Okay? And through that, and through his ability as being fashioned as a man, therefore he could be subject to death. Therefore he did submit to death on the cross in that manner, in this way. But you see, never once did it ever say that he forsook his Godhead or forsook any of his divine nature. What do you mean by forsook? Real quick, I left him behind, were no longer a part of him. Okay. They were always a part of him. Okay. He was always God. Okay. Yet, he took into himself the nature of man. Basically, God cannot change his nature. God is immutable. God is unchanging. He will not change. And, and uh, you can't add or subtract anything to the character of God. And we went through and we dealt with the attributes, the divine attributes of Christ. We dealt with that Christ was immutable or unchanging. That Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, and forever. And other things that attributed that Jesus Christ doesn't change. He's the same. So somehow, this is interesting to me, somehow in taking on the nature of a man, he didn't change his divine attribute as deity. His deity remained the same. He was still, what, you know, as what we call, when we define deity, 
in the doctrine of God, we dealt with the attributes of God. Uh, what what makes God God? Well, his, his natural and moral attributes, things like his omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence, his all-knowing, all-present, all-powerful, never-changing, eternal, uh, and then the same thing on the moral side, he's holy, he's just, he's righteous, he's good. And this is what we have observed as man, and we say, this is what makes God God. And then we say, well, we see these things in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ claimed these things. Jesus Christ claimed to be God. And in doing that, and taking on the nature of man, he never changed his divine nature. But he allowed himself to be limited. In his human nature. He allowed himself to be thirsty. You know, these kind of things. He took right. on those limitations and allowed his, you know, God to kind of be limited in there to the, instead of, he could have overcome, you know, he could have said, oh, well, I don't really need to eat. You know, I, I, he had the capability of God, as God to overcome those, yet he chose not to. Right. But in his deity, he wasn't just... See, that's what I'm, that's, this is, this is what's hard to understand. Yeah, understand. In his deity, he wasn't confined to that body. True. Yet his deity appeared to act through that body. His divine nature acted through the body at times, yet he lived a life as a perfect human being in submission to the Spirit, as led by the Spirit. And at times he seemed to possess and do things that natural man I don't know if you ever do. Like, I, I don't know what is in man like Jesus Christ did. He's, I, he knew man and knew what was in man. Well, I know a few men, and i got a good idea sometimes what's in there, but I don't know them. And I don't know the Father as he knows me. Those sort of things, you know. But yet, in his life and in his functioning, he acted as a man. And it wasn't like he had some big advantage over you and I. That was part of the, the uh, incarnation. Could the question could the question be maybe that uh, what we're struggling with is whether Jesus drew upon his own power as God to accomplish miracles, walk on the water, do whatever, or was he only again a vehicle through which the Spirit was able to do as God will that um, he walk on the water, that he do this? It seems like. At times, he drew on his own authority, on his own power. Now, you know, he did only that which he saw the Father do. He only did that which the Father told him to do. So, and he was driven and led by the Spirit. He didn't drive himself or be. Right. So, he was a um, servant. Okay. So, what moved him in the temple with the red cords? What's that? What moved him in the temple with the red cords? Uh, let's see, what was the prophecy? You know, a zeal has consumed me. Uh, you know, it appears that the Spirit of God moved him in that direction. Yes, Alan? Was it, was it more as his prerogatives that he emptied himself of rather than his attributes? What do you mean? Well, he, you know, what what he is, he, you know, I, I, it wouldn't seem like he could ever change, or it would be impossible for him not to be what he was, but what he had a right to, and the things and, and the things that he that he had a right to have or receive as God, it would seem like maybe those things he would be able to say, well, I'm going to lay those aside. Or the, the things that he had the right to exercise. In his humanity, yeah. he did that, yes. But he never surrendered them. And he still he was still God, and he didn't exercise that in his humanity. But in his deity, he was still who he always was. You know, when Jesus Christ was on the earth, or when, you know, when he died on the cross, you know, what happened? That's 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 you know, who held the world together when God died. <laughs> Jesus Christ was still God. Yeah. His humanity was what perished on the cross. Okay, so 
The idea of the kenosis and defining the emptying of Christ without giving up or di diminishing any of his divine attributes or essential qualities as deity, of deity as man. First one is that um, the humiliation of Christ consisted of veiling his pre-incarnate glory. The humiliation of Christ was in the veiling of his glory that he had with the Father before the world was. Um, he had that idea, John 17, you know, Father, glorify me with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So obviously, the full glory of Christ was not there. I mean, he wasn't at his full intensity as he was prior to his incarnation. Um, you get glimpses of it at the Mount of Transfiguration. You get, you know, whatever that was like, which must have been pretty incredible. Uh, you get an idea of, of a glorified, the glorification of, of a, of a man. Uh, and then the appearances of Christ post ascension seem to be in his glorified state, uh, and, and like his appearance to Paul. His appearance to John in the book of Revelation, you know, and that's awesome sight, awesome things. Not just mere man, like after his resurrection, you know, well, you know, they didn't necessarily know who he was. And, you know, there was no doubt when John was in the heaven and the angels are worshiping him, there's the lamb, uh, though he were slain. Now, um, This condescension was necessary, was a necessary act in the union of Christ to an unglorified humanity for the ultimate humiliation on the cross. He had to come down to man and become a man to die on the cross. And uh, which we said before was his ultimate plan of his life. And that the purpose of the incarnation, in, in the incarnation, he didn't surrender his attributes, but he voluntarily submitted to not, not to use those in order that he might obtain his objectives. It's interesting, I, I, one statement that I read while I was studying this is that he never exercised his divine attributes in his own behalf. As in his omniscience, he revealed his prophetic ministry, he spoke of God, but he never used it to make his own life easier. Um, you know, and, and in his power, he never used the, his power to make his own life easier. He never, you know, he didn't turn the bread into, the stones into bread. He, you know, he used his power to heal the sick, to cleanse the lepers. Uh, and I thought that was an interesting statement. I never thought of it that way. Um, that he never exercised his divine attributes in, on his own behalf. He said, you know, um, you know, at the, when they came to get him, don't, you know, don't you think that if I wanted, I, my father would send a legion of angels. I'd get a legion of angels here if I wanted them. But he didn't. And I think his desire, you know, he didn't want to go to the cross. He did not want to do that. But his will, which was the will to, to do the will, father's will, went ahead and did it. Now, um, and keep in mind that the limitation of power related to his human nature only, not his divine. And I don't totally have grasped the idea of him performing miracles, appeared, appeared to be performing miracles in his own authority, and yet that he would grow tired, that he'd hunger. He'd have to stop and rest. He'd have to sleep. He, you know, the, the basic physical and sinless limitations, now keep this in mind, you know, it's not a sin to be tired. It's not a sin to, to be hungry and all these things. So, I don't totally have this, I don't know if I ever will, but the idea of, of that 
it appeared that at times him acting in his own power, though he may have been acting in the power of the Spirit, um, still knowing these, these human elements of, of tiredness and stuff. Yes? Well, that reminds me of um, when he was on the cross and they were accusing him of, if you're the Son of God and you could save others, why can't you save yourself? Yeah, that's right. On the cross they said that. Mm -hmm. So he chose not to. Yeah, good yeah. thing for us. And Christ voluntarily chose to be dependent on the Father and the Holy Spirit. He chose to be dependent on the Father and the Holy Spirit. And uh, you have, in, you know, like in... Uh, Let's see, in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do, for whatsoever thing he does, these also doeth the Son in the same manner. So, you could go back and say that you know, anything that he performed or did, he first had direct direction from the Father. Because in his life, he chose to, to be at the Father's and the and leading of the Holy Spirit. You have, and the book, Gospel of Mark is the one I really enjoy. It's baptism the most. It's just the fact that when he came out of the water, the Spirit descended, the Father spoke, and the Spirit drove him into the wilderness immediately. So, And then, you know, but then when he stands there at the, at the tomb of Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. Was he, you know, was that something the Father showed him? Or, you know, was that his own authority? Didn't he still the storm? Just be still. Calm nature. All of these points basically add up to this. And the doctrine of the kenosis is that Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, became a man, never surrendering His attributes as God. He was always God. Yet, of necessity for us, He became a man and took upon Him the form of a servant, the outward manifestation of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man, and being found in the fashion of a man, humbled himself to death on the cross. So he acted as a man, he lived as a man, empowered by the Spirit. And these are things that they just they don't add up in my mind. It's hard sometimes to add this stuff up. I don't I don't really understand, but I don't think that's what God wants. I don't you know God didn't ever tell us to understand Him. He told us to believe, and He gives us enough facts to believe what He expects us to. So, are there any questions on the doctrine of the kenosis or the humiliation and condescension of Christ? Okay, let's, let's um, let me give you a homework assignment. What I'd like you to do in this homework is I just want to get you thinking on this idea of the humiliation of Christ and the, the idea of the kenosis. So, so what I like you to do is using one or more scriptures. Um, I'd like to use one as a text, as a basic text. That means build your basic argument off of a particular scripture. And uh, I use the word fine. 
the doctrine of the kenosis. So I'm, I don't, I'm not looking for a, a real long you know, multi-page thesis. Just to get the point across and, you know, by getting you to restate in your own words what we learned tonight, using one or more scriptures and using one basic text, one scripture, one, one scripture for your basic text, to find the doctrine of the condescension and humiliation of Christ, one page or less. Any questions on homework? Yes, Con. Not on the homework, because you're going to cover the at all tonight. Uh huh. No. Not tonight. Next week we'll be discussing the impeccability. Um, oh, and another thing in your text, uh, why don't you go ahead and read over the impeccability, which is uh, pages uh, 145 to 152, and um, start in the the reading about the suffering and death of Christ, I would suggest that you read um, at least the first half of it. And uh, we'll be covering, we'll be moving into impeccability next week in the suffering and death of Christ. Impeccability meaning that Christ could not have sinned. So, we'll be addressing that interesting topic next week. So, and now you guys know what the topic is and you can arm yourselves. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this night. And we come before you now and uh, thank you, Lord, that you have given us your word and how we can systematically take your word and, and uh, just come to some truths about you. And I pray that these things would strengthen us in our faith, in our individual walks, Lord, and strengthen us to be able to endure uh, the trials and to be able to share you with those, to, to reach out and, and, as you said, love, love God and love God our neighbor, Lord. Help us to do that. And help us to spend time loving one another. And ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.